Hey everyone, welcome to the channel. I hope you're all doing well. In today's video, we'll be kickstarting the Serverless Saturday series with an introductory tutorial on creating your first AWS Lambda function. And to begin, we'll quickly go over a few slides about what AWS Lambda is all about, and afterwards, we'll dive right into launching our first Lambda function. So what exactly is AWS Lambda? Lambda is AWS's core compute service for serverless applications. The reason being that it essentially allows you to run practically any code you write, and you can do all of this without managing any physical servers, which is a huge perk. And this is made possible because all the server maintenance is handled by AWS. And for those who are interested, when you spin up a Lambda function, AWS actually creates a new container on its machines with a desired amount of RAM and CPU allocation, and we'll see how simple it is later in this video. Also, like most of the other serverless set of services on the cloud, you will only be running your code when needed. And this means your function execution will follow a pay-as-you-use billing model. Now, I've realized that we mentioned the term serverless quite a few times so far. And if you'd like to learn more about what serverless is all about in general, feel free to check out my intro to serverless video, which I'll link in the description below. Now, let's move on to when you'd want to use AWS Lambda. Lambda primarily runs on event-based triggers such as S3, DynamoDB, API Gateway, and many more. What that means is if you have an event-based architecture, such as setting up a data pipeline, or you want to respond to a client making a request to your API, or for example, you want to process a user's file upload, AWS Lambda enables you to handle all that processing through code. And in future videos in this series, we'll be covering the power of different triggers and what you can do with them. Anyway, this relates to our second point in that your application has an inherent serverless architecture, which is generally event-based. Now, another reason why developers may choose to use AWS Lambda is for the quick deployment and release time. For instance, if you're a startup and you need to quickly set up a pipeline to process file uploads, AWS Lambda significantly reduces the development time by managing most of the deployment for you. So all you need to worry about is writing great code. Now that's a good segue to our next slide on, which, on why you might want to use AWS Lambda. And I've only listed a few of the key reasons here, starting with the fact that it's really cheap. And um, if I just exit here and we take a look at the AWS pricing um, on their official website, you can see that in the always free tier, um, I've checked here, you will always get a million free requests per month. And if you're just like doing this for a personal project or, or like a hobbyist um, or trying something new, um, one million requests per month, I, I, I think this will satisfy um, your requirements for most use cases. And of course, and afterwards, um, after the free tier, uh, there's also the use, you start getting charged real amounts for, uh, per execution that depends on your RAM usage and your CPU usage as well. But again, it's really cheap and we can cover uh, the pricing model in a future video. But anyway, back to the slides. So on top of the uh, AWS Lambda being really cheap, um, we've also mentioned earlier that it, it eliminates server maintenance, which is a huge perk. And because AWS manages the infrastructure behind your Lambda function, your code will also automatically scale with demand. And that's a promise that AWS provides for you. And finally, again, Lambda also enables developers to have quick deployment and new releases. Now that I've hopefully convinced you of the benefits of using Lambda, let's go ahead and create our first Lambda function. All right, so to begin creating our Lambda function, uh, we'll head over to the AWS Management Console. And once you've logged in, we can just search for the Lambda resource, select it, and we'll give it a second to load here. And awesome, once it's loaded, we can hit create function. Uh, we'll be using the from scratch option and we'll name our function, uh, my function. Um, and for the sake of this tutorial, we'll be using Node.js and the latest version supported by Lambda is actually 12.x, so we'll select that. Um, please do keep in mind that Lambda actually restricts you in terms of the versions and uh, the languages that you're allowed to use. Um, so these are the available options. Um, so after that, we can just select the default uh, execution rule that Lambda will create for us. And in this video, uh, we won't really be covering the advanced settings, so we can leave that blank for now. And we can go ahead and hit create function. And so this take like maybe like 15 seconds. And what it's doing behind the scenes right now is that AWS is actually creating that container for us with the allocated amount of RAM and CPU um, with our boilerplate code so that we can run our function uh, isolated from all other functions deployed on um, AWS machines. Um, so, uh, which, okay, awesome, it's loaded. So AWS actually is uh, great enough to actually give us some boilerplate code. As you can see here, it's just a simple uh, response object that's being created with a status code and a stringified 
uh, object stratified body and it's being returned. Um, so if we go ahead and, and click test here, uh, we'll just create a random event name because uh, we won't really be going into detail on that for this video. Um, so we'll just create that. If we hit test, we can see in the details that the response object is exactly as we expect. Uh, the status code with the body, hello from Lambda, as indicated here. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. Um, so one thing to note is that um, right now, we can. it appears that we can edit uh, our, our function body, our function code, like directly in the AWS Management Console. And this is only because um, our code is really, really short. And I, I forgot the exact limit, but um, the there is a very small limit in terms of how many lines or how many characters you can write in the Management Console before you are no longer able to see it here. Um, so if you have a if you were doing like a writing a real function with some real purpose, it'll definitely take probably like maybe like 50 lines at least. Um, you won't be able to see this here anymore. And ideally you'll have some form of continuous integration set up, um, which we will actually cover in the next video. Um, then you can actually edit your code in your own editor and whatnot and deploy and, it'll, and then um, it will be automatically deployed to AWS. Um, so you won't have to edit it here. But for the sake of this video, um, all our code will be really short. And yeah, so if we want to change this actually, um, for example, if we want to change it to change it so that our Lambda handler returns um, maybe like a random integer between uh, one and a hundred or something. So we'll do random number. Um, and if we want it to be an integer, we'll do parsint. Um, okay, yeah, and anyway, if we want it to return random number, we can do that and yeah. And we'll hit deploy, and that's just deploying it to the container again, updating the code for us. And if we hit test, you can see that it gets us a random integer. Hit test again, it gets us a new one. So it's really fast and it's really clear. And as you can see here, there's also a bunch of other details. Um, let's head over to CloudWatch and I'll go over those details and what they mean. So CloudWatch is actually a really good debugging service um, it, and on it by default, it's already linked to every function invocation for Lambda. And what that means is that every time you invoke your Lambda function, you will automatically see a log uh, for the results and, and anything related to that function. So if we if we take a look at the latest log stream here, um, we can see some logs. And by default, Lambda provides you with the start, end, and report log. Start and end just tells you when your Lambda function gets started and when it ends. And a report is just like a summary um, telling you how long it took, how much memory it used, and how the duration for which it will be billed for. Um, so things like that. Um, pretty useful if you're doing things like cost analysis um, or just debugging in general. Um, so we don't actually have any custom logs yet. So we can try to go ahead and add that. Um, for example, if you want to log um, some, your random number before you actually return it and say something like, this is my random number. And oops, number, okay, there we go. And we'll update our Lambda function and we hit test again. Um, and be mindful that that uh, CloudWatch does have a bit of delay sometimes. Um, so it might take a bit for it to appear here. Hopefully it's in our latest log stream. We'll just take a look. Okay, awesome, it's here. So as you can see here, we do get a custom log message with a timestamp as well. And the log message here, this is my random number 78. If we, log, if we run it again, it'll probably produce a different number. But that's pretty much a quick overview of how CloudWatch is connected to Lambda. So if you're ever debugging, definitely head to CloudWatch um, and make sure you do have logs. Uh, and this will be a great de de debugging tool when you're developing on AWS Lambda. All right, so let's head over back to the AWS Lambda Management Console. Um, and one thing to note is that, um, as you can see here, the, fun the file name created to hold our Lambda handler is called index.js. This can be named whatever you want, but by default, they just named it index.js. And how we reference the Lambda handler, like the entry point to our fu Lambda function is by, um, specify, specifying it like this, the Lambda handler. So it goes in a format like this where the first thing is the file name um, and then you put dot and then you put the um, you put the function name. So as you can see here, this thing, our function here is called handler. If this was named something like handler2, uh, we would change this to index.handler2. And likewise, if you had, if this index.js file was nested within folders, um, 
I believe it would just be, for example, index dot subfolder dot subfolder dot handler, um, wherever your handler function is resting in. So we'll change that back to handler for now because that's already set up for us. And yeah, that's for our runtime settings. Now, if we scroll down and head down to environment variables, one cool thing here is that, for example, if you want to have a different set of control flow for um, like a production QA or development environment, you can you might want to consider using like environment variable to set that, and maybe that might be useful for you, maybe not. Um, but environment variables in general are quite useful for different reasons, and you can definitely configure them here and add them, and you can reference them in your code, which is a great feature about AWS Lambda. Now, moving on to tags, this, um, if you're just doing this for like a personal project or you're a hobbyist, um, tags may not be like the utmost concern here because as mentioned here, tags are mostly for tracking your AWS cost. And it, where it becomes really useful is especially if you're in a large company, um, we have many teams, um, maybe like the cost team or whatever, um, they might want to track how much, how many resources, like how many AWS Lambda functions are being used um, per team. And they might want to do cost reductions by team or something like that. And if you are have everything tagged correctly, um, it becomes a lot easier for them to view everything and analyze everything. So that's what tags are for. Um, now moving on, uh, one interesting thing is that we can actually configure the amount of memory used for our Lambda function. Um, so here uh, we can configure anything between 128 and uh, 10,000 megabytes. Um, if you have an application that requires uh, more memory, for example, like processing a large image or a video, or um, I'm not too sure, like a PDF or whatever, um, you can definitely scale up um, to use more memory. Um, and a great way to know how much memory you need to use is by, again, going back to CloudWatch logs. Um, first, write maybe your boilerplate code and then analyze the logs, seeing how much memory is being used. And if it's not enough, definitely try to scale up. And yeah, another thing is the timeout here. Um, one important thing to note is that your Lambda function will, by default, terminate um, when the timeout is exceeded. So if your Lambda function does, for some reason is taking too long, um, it does not finish in time, and is, in this case does not finish within three seconds, it will automatically terminate and you may not uh, get the desired result that you perhaps uh, wanted. And yeah, so just be careful when, when, when deciding on a timeout. Again, CloudWatch is a great way to help you identify what kind of timeout you need for your serverless application. Um, you can also specify description. Uh, we don't need that. And the role is just the default role for now. So let's head on back. Um, and we'll scroll down here. And yeah, as you can see here, by default, Lambda already connects AWS CloudWatch for you um, for every Lambda invocation. And one cool thing, actually, um, is that AWS Lambda it's, it's supposed to be a stateless service um, in the sense that you aren't really supposed to store state, but they do give you, um, and last I checked, it was 512 megabytes of file system memory that you can actually store. So for example, if you're storing like a file, a temporary file, you could use this and you can add a new file system. However, this should definitely only be used as a temporary file system because um, Lambda actually allows you to have concurrent um, applications. So for example, uh, if you run one invocation, sorry, for example, if, for example, one invocation um, of your Lambda function will not be able to access the same file system as the subsequent invocation, especially if they're like right next to, um, called right next to each other. Um, so definitely do be careful of that. And generally there, you may not want to use a file system just because of that risk, but definitely do be careful. But AWS does provide it there for you in case you need it, which is great. Um, and that does lead us to um, concurrency, which is one great purpose of using AWS Lambda or any sort of cloud provided serverless function service. And the reason is that cloud services allow you to scale. And one way of doing that is by allowing you to run at scale. And that's why you can run Lambda functions concurrently. And by default, they allow you to have a maximum of a thousand. So that means you can have the same function being called a thousand times at the same and running at the same time. And of course, this will um, make debugging possibly a bit trickier, especially if you have a lot of requests coming in. So do be careful. And depending on your use case, you may want to um, edit that or lower it perhaps. Um, so yeah, you can definitely feel free to play around with that. 
Um, and yeah, that pretty much covers most of the details um, for our Lambda function here. And so let's just head on over back to functions. And so if you want to ever delete your function, um, you can just go here, click, check the thing, check your function um, and hit delete. And you definitely want to make sure you don't need to access any logs or other things related to your function before deleting it, um, because they will become non-retrievable. So once that is the case, we can just hit delete and everything is deleted. And we have, and yeah, and now it's gone. Yeah, anyway, that pretty much wraps up the video. And if you enjoyed or learned something from this video, please consider hitting that like and subscribe button. But for now, I hope you all have a great day and I'll see you in the next video.